Kia ora Ato. Thanks again for tuning in to the Shift Aotearoa and Vision Week and having a listen to some of our one-on-one interviews with uh, some uh, leading light, lights in housing in Aotearoa, but also just some people who know about housing in Aotearoa and have experiences. Uh, so today I'm blessed to be talking with Ro Hoskins, the chair of Te Matapihi, and uh, I'll let him uh, provide us with a little introduction and then uh, provide some reflections and some thoughts about uh, the impact of the COVID crisis. So uh, kia ora rau and thanks for joining us. Tēnā koe, Brennan. Uh, o te rā, ngā mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Yeah, just in terms of the, the COVID uh, crisis, I think um, what that has done for, for Māori in general is exacerbated many of the issues that were already um, quite pressing, in particular overcrowding and um, with, with the inability of Fano to rotate themselves around different family groups um, to relieve pressure, social pressures. Um, obviously, there have been um, some, some significant issues there. So that issue uh, was present before COVID and it's, it's, it was even more present during COVID. Um, on a slightly more positive note, the announcement in, during Level 2 that... Um, 30 square metre uh, building code exemption for sleep outs is um, generally a positive move and will help to some degree with um, overcrowding as long as there is government support for both the design um, and also financing of those uh, additional elements. So in the past, we've called them whare tāpiri. And I think they fulfil a, a very important role because Māori have always come from clustered living environments. We, we never came from living in one large dwelling. And so um, there's a lot of value in um, having a series of connected, well-built, warm, dry um, whare tāpiri to often uh, be appended or added to an existing parent dwelling. So that, that's a positive dimension that came out during COVID, but I know it's been worked on for, for many years. Um, in terms of um, looking forward to a, um, uh, a post-COVID Māori housing sector, what's been also very uh, important for us is, is the ability to convene weekly and now fortnightly um, Zoom meetings with the Māori housing sector, including uh, the uh, government housing agencies. Uh, so that's uh, been um, MSD, TPK, uh, Kainga Ora and Emhud have all been uh, present in, in our uh, weekly and, and now fortnightly Zui. So that's uh, been a good way to bring the Māori housing sector together on a regular basis and for, the, uh, for those providers to talk about their particular issues around the mutu. And it's fair to say that it's been real, a real insight into how, how varied the issues are around the mutu and the different ways that our housing agencies, iwi agencies have been responding and stepping up. I think there's certainly an issue um, ahead of us where the, some of the direct support for remote whānau in terms of food parcels, hygiene parcels, um, that was being provided during uh, COVID levels four and three. And the questions remain about how then, as we move into the depths of winter, how then do we provide some level of continuity with that housing support, whānau support. Um, the other thing that was um, uh, came out during COVID was that uh, issues that were suspected to be um, in place were confirmed to be in place with our uh, whānau members knocking on doors and seeing firsthand um, the housing conditions that whānau were living in and seeing firsthand um, levels of overcrowding. So um, reports that I've had have, have um, really focused on, well, I can't unsee what I've seen, so I can't go back to just pretending that those whānau uh, are not in a huge need. So I think that there's going to be a lot more advocacy, particularly in the rural areas, uh, for those whānau whose, whose plights have actually been visibilised uh, through COVID responses. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of looking ahead to a, you know a, a vision a vision for the future of, of Māori housing, I guess that vision is is always going to be attached to 
uh, a, an, an enlivened and enhanced Māori housing sector because we can't really have a, 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 a brave new Māori housing future without a sector which is really um, upskilled and a resource to fulfil multiple roles around the motu. I think the first part of the vision is that we will quite quickly move to having um, a, a dedicated marae or um, lower level or tier, tier two level um, registration for Māori housing providers who don't aim to be super providers. I don't aim to be providing, say, more than 10 dwellings in their valley or in their inner or around their marae and consequently um, require a, a registration regime which is much more appropriate to the work that they're actually going to be doing. So that's, that's important because around the Motu there's 50 to 100 marae that um, have komato flats and are running them themselves, tenanting them themselves, leasing them themselves and, um, and just getting by and without any subsidy or any acknowledgement of the critical role that they're actually playing. So in order for those, um, those housing providers who, who in many cases don't see themselves as housing providers to be eligible for things like IRRS, then um, we need to have that um, marae based accreditation regime, which is not going to take 18 months uh, to, to get through as is, as is common with the CHRA registration process at present. So if we can have that um, alternative registration process in place and we can support, better support those existing providers who may wish to um, upgrade their stock, um, add additional units to their stock, then I think we'll at least be strengthening our existing sector. And then as we look forward to um, a future in both uh, urban and rural areas, we can't help but, but imagine a situation where, where Māori are able to readily be supported into high quality intergenerational housing solutions. And the intergenerational term has begun to be used a lot more, but uh, it's fair to say that our housing stock um, is um, has been just about totally informed and in designed by nuclear Pākehā families. So the two, three or four bedroom single dwelling um, is, is what characterises our whole stock. And that's not our past and it's not our future. And so um, we must, um, all of us, uh, continue to advocate and press our agencies, Kainga Order in particular, to ensure that the public housing that they provide, the social housing they provide, the, the affordable housing that they provide is actually truly intergenerational. That it allows for, at a minimum, a, a self-contained unit for a kuia komatua at a minimum so that um, you can have two uh, adjoining or connected households uh, with an appropriate level of separation to allow some independence. Um, there's a huge amount of resistance to that from um, the powers that be, and it's extremely frustrating to have to bang on about intergenerational housing solutions. Um, so intergenerational, uh, number one, uh, the next key issue is that our, our housing stock needs to be uh, designed to respond to changing occupancies so that we know that we have um, more children and more adults per whare and we've got children coming back from overseas or down the line and we've got um, other people, um, uncles and aunties arriving, staying a week, staying three months. Um, we've got to have um, housing stock which can be much more responsive to changing occupancies. And that includes things like mezzanine sleeping uh, areas, it means, uh, it normally means more bathrooms per, per whare, and it certainly means large living rooms and, and, and well-equipped kitchens. Um, in terms of uh, the COVID situation, uh, you know, we know that um, all the 
seed supplies and and seedlings got sold out in the first couple of days you couldn't buy any seeds even seeds that you couldn't even grow in autumn was was sold out and so i think there's there was a i guess a fear-based um approach to oh I, i need to start growing my own food but i think turning that into a positive there's a um a really important role for our new housing developments to be master planned to include uh making a kai resilience so that we have at a minimum uh, a minimum area of of uh fenu set aside for raised bed gardens for some basic orchard trees for a row of fejoas along the fence line um uh, so that um you know it's that a certain percentage of um day-to-day food uh fruit and vegetables can actually be um provided through um those wider planned living environments this is something that's not new in the 1930s and 40s when um when vast swathes of of suburban aotearoa were being developed with social housing uh, fruit trees were dropped off on the street you would walk out onto the street choose what fruit tree you wanted walk out the back and plant it this that was 1940s now come on how long is it since since um that that has happened 60 70 years since that sort of progressive approach to to um you know just some basic level of of uh, food and vegetable pr- provision was allowed for i guess um uh, what we also need in an urban situation is the ability for uh, rangatahi to achieve progressive home ownership through working with their whānau and or friends uh looking at fano mortgage instruments uh which enable um people even in quite heated real estate environments to achieve home ownership and um i guess with our record record low interest rates the next few years there is a there's a um i think a very good opportunity for some progressive um financial instruments to be developed um and rolled out um so that in particular our rangatahi can see a home ownership future uh, and not consign that to the impossible basket which is kind of sitting right now we um we de- we need to have a a suite of housing pro- policies and products which can take uh, any mari fano at any stage and say there is a way for you to improve your housing circumstances whether that is um commuting your um state house uh, lease that you have uh to a uh lease to buy or a progressive home ownership or whether that's uh, support to develop your backyard and master plan that to allow for one or two more living units uh to create an urban papakainga uh we desperately need those products which um uh need to be developed with the Māori has sector themselves along with TPK Kainga Ora and HUD at a at a rural level we um we need a much greater improvement to the um Kainga Whenua loan scheme uh which is generally seen to have failed um with the number of loans provided and we need a uh, alternative arrangement whereby uh there is much greater support provided to fano developing their their papakainga and not leaving it to kiwi bank to administer a a, a program which they were never really interested in in the first place so uh, a vastly improved revamped um, kainga order loan scheme is is essential so that we can have um uh, a durable rural lending product which is actually um well supported by uh in this case kind order and tpk i think um you know if we can look at those urban products and if we can look at much greater a lending capacity in the rural sector and if we can look at uh, alternative uh maori housing provider statuses or credentialing uh then th- those will be the three planks to a, a much enhanced uh future for for Maori housing uh, across the Motu ngami
Right. That was absolutely extraordinary. What a um, what an extraordinary set of really beautifully articulated um, aspirations. I got seven of them um, out of your out of your list, uh, and and I get the sense that you don't need to add anything to that. Um, I, I haven't really got any questions because you've uh, sort of covered the whole gambit. Um, but I'll give you one final chance if there's anything like anything you'd like to add. I think I think um, only the last thing I'd like to add is that um, in 2014 we had a uh, Māori housing strategy developed. It uh, was left out to dry with MB. Uh, it was never operationalised. I think there's now an opportunity for the for the Māori housing sector to come together with key agencies and say, well, actually, um, we do want a housing strategy. Uh, which is going to be operationalised and supported by uh, a suite of of um, policies and products, which are nimble enough to respond to the changing needs of our Fano, and that's the aspiration that we have for the next uh, government, incoming government from September onwards, uh, that we will uh, early in that term, in that new term, that we will move to that uh, Māori housing strategy and, and quickly have a, a series of, um, of um, products which maybe can build on some of the best products of the last 30 years, but many new products which are um, much more fit for purpose for, the, for this post-COVID era. Amazing. Uh, Ro, thanks so much for those thoughts. Just one last comment, because I spoke with Julie Nelson the other night and we were sort of cautiously uh, exploring this issue. You know, she's also in a space where she's working with, um, of, of, well, most of our NGO sector are working with multiple government agencies. And uh, you've mentioned that you're now in regular uh, Zoom chats with uh, four, I think you mentioned, to Penny Kokiri, the Ministry of Social Development, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development and Kaima Order, of course. Um, how, how are you, what's your sense for, you know, we've always had an aspiration that they'd become more joined up, that, the, um, that there'd be less siloing in the government space. What, what's your sense for that at the moment? I think there's more work to be done there. I think, I think we, the Māori housing sector, has been asking for a, a one-stop shop uh, for a long time. And I don't think we're quite there yet. I think where TPK sits in the mix is still yet to be fully determined, but we're mm -hmm. in a lot better position than we were. And I think we're especially heartened by HUD and, uh, and their team there um, and their, I guess, coordinating role in terms of policy setting. I think that's the key. I think um, at the delivery end, um, having uh, stronger relationships between MSD, uh, TPK and Kainga Order is still a uh, work in progress, but we are hopeful that that will also um, occur uh, in the next two or three months uh, so that we can start to really focus on the um, delivery mode and, and making things better sooner for our whanau. Awesome. Uh, well, Kia ora, Ro. I really appreciate you uh, sharing your thoughts uh, and it's really, it is really heartening and I just want to reflect that, that comment. Uh, you know, it's really heartening to hear that you, uh, along with uh, Te Matapihi and the Māori provider sector, uh, are in this close engagement now with government because I know you've all got a good monitoring mind for um, promises made and making sure they're kept and, and things that weren't talked about that needed to be talked about and um, and all of those kinds of things, because it's really a part of um, our history of advocacy in New Zealand, isn't it? So, um, uh, kia ora rau, uh, nā mihi nui ki koe. Um, Thanks so much for joining me, and I really appreciate those thoughts, and uh, I, I'm as excited as ever to have you just kind of express what you think those real uh, key moves we need to make are. So um, I look forward to maybe some other people watching this interview and picking up those and, and running with them, along with ourselves, of course. Good Good Appreciate your time.